Hello, viewers. Welcome to another episode of The Free Marketeers. Uh, this one's going to, going to be a little bit different since we are all officially under lockdown since midnight, midnight last night. Today I'm joined by my fellow Free Marketeers, Martin van Staden and Chris Hutton. Um, yeah, guys, so how, how is lockdown life treating you guys so far, Martin? Well, uh, I am an introvert, so I'm always on uh, lockdown when I'm not at work. So nothing much has changed for me. Um, as you can see, I'm surrounded by my books. Uh, I'm, I've never been happier. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's it, the, the, the knowledge, I guess, that I can't just pop out to go buy some necessities. Or I can, but it's uh, yes. not uh, do it under fear of being beaten up by some soldier or something. That does add a little bit yes. of uh, stress to it. But so far, it's been, it's been going well for me. I just wish we could say the same for the millions of South Africans who can't work now that, that they're on lockdown. Yeah, definitely. Chris, your side? Anything from your side? It just feels a bit odd. And it's day one and it's only just after lunchtime. I've already started uh, talking to my dogs and giving them various personalities. So day one is going well. <laughs> Let's see how it goes from here. Yeah, yeah. So on this issue of the lockdown, um, I've seen J um, Chief Justice Mukwege Mukwege came out and said the courts are in fact staying open and they are preparing for possible counters to this lockdown, legal challenges that that could be brought before the Constitutional Court as well as the High Court and the Supreme Court of Appeal. Um, Martin, do you have any specific comments on this? Do you think this lockdown is consonant with the rule of law and the constitutional requirements? Well, let me just start by saying a bit about the courts being open. Uh, so I wrote an article yesterday, yes. which, uh, sent out this morning, about access to the courts. And I uh, pointed out that um, access to justice has been severely uh, cur curtailed by the lockdown. Definitely. I, I noted yes. the article that the courts are staying open, uh, but it, it has made things difficult for, uh, for mostly poor people to... Uh, to actually access their attorneys because while uh, processes related to to courts which includes attorneys are staying open it's incredibly difficult for these attorneys many of whom especially in rural areas but also uh, uh, attorneys who are maybe poor who only very recently uh, got their licenses they don't have all the necessary equipment at home um, and it's it adds far more hoops to jump through for people to actually access justice in these circumstances and I'm, I'm concerned that it's going to create a constitutional void, uh, which is what I'm calling it, for the next 20, 21 days. Um, that doesn't mean the Constitution is not there anymore, but it does mean that our reliance on the Constitution has been curbed a bit because we can't as easily just pop into court or pop in with a lawyer and say, wow, look at my rights being violated. It's become more difficult. So that's just on that point. Um, on the challenges to the lockdown itself, um, I mean, this is very difficult territory. Even libertarians are divided on this. Now, it's not, it's not saying much when libertarians are divided on something, but the fact is one would imagine that a, a lockdown where state power increases significantly, uh, people would be like, yes, this is wrong. But no, I mean, there are, there are uh, certain justifiable views that, and arguments that can be made that say, well, maybe the state should be uh, intervening this much in, in in private affairs, etc. Uh, I don't know if I agree with those views, but the point is these views do exist. Um, and from a strictly constitutional point, I think that the disaster, the state of disaster, the idea of a state of disaster under the Disaster Management Act, in terms of which this lockdown is taking place, I think is somewhat problematic. The constitution does not provide for anything of the sort. The constitution provides only for a state of emergency and that needs to be specifically declared and in those circumstances rights may be suspended. Um, so it's not limited in terms of section 36 of the constitution, they are suspended outright. Uh, now my view is that that is in fact what is happening. Some of our rights have been suspended, especially the right to movement, freedom of movement, and maybe the right to privacy as well. They have been effectively suspended. Uh, not limited. I need to keep emphasizing that the limitation and the suspension differ by by degrees, and I think we're far beyond uh, the degree of smear limitation. I think we've really entered the realm of suspension. 
And that to me means that President Roman Poisa a few evenings ago had to say that he is declaring a state of emergency. And as a result of that, he is suspending certain rights and that is uh, includes freedom of movement. But currently we're in this, um, I guess these uncharted waters of using section 36, which is the limitation clause in the constitution to somehow bring about a state of emergency-esque situation where rights are suspended. The Minister of Justice said we're now operating in terms of Section 36. I've never heard that being said ever before. I don't even think that's how it works. So yes, long story short, I do think that there are grounds to challenge, uh, challenge the, the current regulations. Uh, there will also be grounds if a state of emergency is declared to challenge the state of emergency itself because I don't think there's been a breakdown in public order and you need to have a breakdown in public order to declare in a state of emergency. So yes, many legal challenges are available. Um, but like I said, uncharted waters, the courts could go either way. Uh, this is not something that South Africa has experienced under its um, current new constitutional dispensation. So other than the terror and the horror at what's happening, I find it extremely interesting. And as a constitutional jurist, I'm definitely going to be uh, keeping my eyes open and seeing what happens. Yes, uh, just to give some, um, some more detail for the viewers. So basically, when we say a right has been suspended, people might argue, well, you're still allowed to go to the supermarket or the local corner cafe for groceries, etc. But what's important to note here is that is not free movement per se, because that movement in and of itself is entirely subject to government approval if the military or the police stop you on the road they aren't satisfied that you are either going or coming coming from the grocery store you can get into trouble so the concept of free movement has indeed entirely been suspended mm. as is currently the case and that is the argument that one can make is that suspension of rights can only be, or rights can only be suspended in terms of section 37, which as you rightfully pointed out, Martin, the requirements for a declaration of a state of emergency under section 37, those two requirements cannot be met. There's still order, there's still peace um, relative to the little bit of order and peace that is always present in South Africa. So yeah, I think that's definitely a very, very valid point is that the right to freedom of movement has indeed been suspended and not merely limited and the extent of that is is simply not justifiable in terms of section 36 i mean i've read articles by other constitutional legal scholars who also refer to this point that it is quite possibly just simply unjustifiable then again the courts will be very very unpopular with the public if they come out and declare this unconstitutional because remember this is a very technical point this is a legal point that people aren't necessarily aware of so i think the way we need to approach this when we inform and educate the public about what's actually happening what's actually underway we need to frame it in such a way that they should be at the end of the day, be more scared of government intrusions into their lives currently and how the coronavirus enables this than they are scared of the coronavirus itself. And I mean, I think there are definitely less uh, uh, invasive means to achieve the same, to achieve the same outcome, mass testing, for example. And I mean, the viewers can also check on the Free Market Foundation's website where we made 12 proposals to National Treasury because they opened an what we call an email hotline for such proposals that we basically are arguing for a lot of diversion of funds to the Department of Health that can enable mass healthcare testing. I mean, the problem in South Africa is compared to developed countries such as South Korea, which had a quite brilliant response to this outbreak is social distancing is not necessarily uh, feasible in townships and areas where the people are extremely densely populated. You have poor families living five families in a one bedroom home, for instance, but that still does not necessarily justify the extent of the limitation to which this is, to which, um, which the government government's currently implementing. Uh, Chris, do you have any thoughts on this from your side? Um, I think you guys have really covered the, the legal ground very well. <laughs> um, so I'm not going to add anything to that side, particularly just from the impact of regulations and, and clampdowns and lockdowns on, on, on societies in general. Um, we should always keep in mind that 
these sorts of things have a disproportional effect on poorer people. Um, their movement is yes. a lot more restricted. So for us, for more middle class people, more affluent people, they can still, they can afford things, you know, they can get food delivered, they can move around. Um, and then for those of us who might fall foul of the law, we can afford to have good representation in the court, in the courts of law for poorer people. That's obviously a lot harder. Yes. So I think it's important to emphasize that point a lot. Yes, there's a lot of public sentiment um, pushing for clampdowns, such as we've seen around the world. So you're not really going to win that argument. But people also need to very much keep in mind that when you do this sort of thing, it really affects poorer citizens a lot more than those who are more well off. Yeah, that's important. That's a very important point is that people will be unequally affected by this and more so by government's um, regulations that they've imposed. And just from a philosophical perspective, Chris, I think this is the perfect time to point out the underlying philosophy, which people have the philosophy of the state should always come to the rescue. I mean, this is not me saying the state shouldn't do anything, but this whole philosophy that the state, whenever there's even a slight chance of disruption occurring in society that the, that the state should impose severe restrictions on people's freedom and people are basically basically bowing in front of government at this moment shining the government boots i mean i've seen posts where people are glorifying the military and how brave they are for going out there meanwhile i just saw a video of the of military officials um not entirely acting within their mandate even before the lockdown was was a, and came into effect since meant like last night so i think there's a whole situation just showing the underlying philosophy that a lot of people have and the and the state's mandate just how extensive people need to be especially in situations and especially when people are scared there's a definite, I think there's a big desire and a need amongst people for a, a strong leader or strong figure, whether it's in the form of one person, or whether it's the form of a government, but people seem to, to want that sort of figure when a crisis happens. It's interesting, as this coronavirus epidemic has um, spread out around the world from China, um, that governments to greater and lesser extents have followed the Chinese government's reaction of clampdowns um, and yeah. restrictions on information. So... I think people's people hopefully this can be a good learning sort of curve for a lot of people maybe a damascus moment even that the the gut reaction should always be transparency and openness and information because then people can make better decisions for themselves yes not everyone is going to make rational decisions but if you have the right information available if scientists and innovators have all the information available and they're free to innovate and um, come up with the right solutions the right medicines the right preventative measures then people can actually use them. The problem is that governments have restricted innovation and movement so much over the last, let's say, 50 years even, that when a crisis happens, they, their automatic reaction is clamping down and people seem to want that sort of thing. So I think you highlight an important point. This, this could be a good point in history where people, again, have a deep discussion about what the proper role of the state ought to be. Mm. Yes, definitely. And I think what people need to realize is this is, causing a massive shift in the Overton window. I mean, I saw mm -hmm. quite the post yesterday on Facebook. One of my friends said, so the far right have got their dream of a police state and closed borders, whereas the far left have got their dream of massive quantitative easing being imposed. So this is sort of both sides have their bad ideas currently coming into play here. And I think that that can pose quite a problem when we see this Overton window shifting and a lot of people are saying, yeah, well, we should ignore what's currently happening, wait till it's over, and then start um, opposing government intrusions into freedom. But that's exactly the point. If we don't start now, what's going to happen afterwards? You give them a pinky, they might as well devour your whole arm. And that's the, that is the point that we're trying to make, is we're not against people being protected from COVID-19. What we are against is always or what we are for rather is always keeping always holding government to account and that should never ever be forgotten and the government should always adhere to the concepts of constitutionalism to our constitution its provisions and just as importantly the rule of law the imperatives of the rule of law that they not pass arbitrary 
restrictions on freedom, that it be properly justified, as little amount of discretionary powers as possible given to delegated officials, especially now that the military has been deployed. I mean, that was, that was really a, 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 an extensive move, if I can call it that, by the presidency to, to basically let the military go out on the streets and help the police, basically police society. I mean, it shows that it seems as if government is expecting a lot of rights, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I think putting the military out on the street, that might have been a, a step too far, a step too far from, from the presidency. And that's exactly why we should hold government to account. But that has all been said and done. So moving on to the next topic is what I mentioned earlier, the FMS proposals to National Treasury on what National Treasury should do. And I just want to run quickly through these proposals for our listeners. So for instance, the first proposal that, that we made is that a moratorium on all pernicious taxes. Now these are taxes such as estate duties, transfer duties, taxes on retirement funds and capital gains. There must be a moratorium placed on all these taxes to free up money for citizens. And I mean, they're still, even though it's in a time of crisis, even when we're not in crisis, the inherent problem with these sorts of taxes is it's a form of double taxation. You, can, you get taxed doubly through these taxes. Now, um, I really think that uh, that's a very good proposal. And the lowering of corporate income taxes and exemption of all small and medium business enterprises from such taxes. Uh, and this is especially important for me. Our fourth proposal is a moratorium on all future bailouts for SOEs and the diversion of those funds to the Department of Health. I mean, I saw news reports about, um, reportedly, um, do not quote me on this, but reportedly SA Express are moving to apply for funds um, that, that's only been made available for businesses suffering from the impacts of COVID-19. So I think government should place a moratorium on all the extension of all sorts of funds like that and immediately divert it, divert it to the healthcare sector uh, do you guys have any any specific thoughts on this and the bailouts for SOEs that were given to them recently in general? Yeah, uh, I'll jump in here. Sorry, Martin. Um, I'll just go quickly first. I th just I would really like to highlight the SOE point because it's very much been accepted that governments need to provide healthcare to their citizens. So if this is taken as a must, um, our government especially is pushing the national health insurance idea of nationalizing all health care under its control. If they're really that serious about providing good health care for South Africans, especially poor South Africans, the overwhelming majority of whom are black, they would really focus on spending what money they do have on public health care, on improving public health care and not bringing down private health care to that level. It's, I think it's it's a great misallocation of priorities and resources to bail out uh, an airline that was failing in any case. Um, well, two airlines, SAA and SA Express. And of course, we all know all the stories with ESCOM. So just, uh, I think that's one very big one to highlight is if government is truly concerned about the plight of poor South Africans, it should get its priorities right. Yeah, I think there's a broader point that we definitely should not lose sight of. And that is that South Africa went into the COVID-19 outbreak in a recession. It's not uh, like, uh, I don't want to seem like I'm going to overanalyze this, but this is something that I think is probably going to happen because I've seen it happen elsewhere. So this recession thing happened in such close proximity to the start of the uh, COVID-19 thing that I think in, in future years, people are going to point back to COVID-19, the outbreak being the start of South Africa's massive economic woes and oh my goodness this virus mm -hmm. really wrecked the economy no <laughs> that is totally totally wrong this government has this word is often used mismanaged the economy we don't want government to manage the economy at all but what it has mm -hmm. done in the economy has totally brought ruin to our economy even when there is no outbreak and that is what has caused our economy to be so weak going into the outbreak when it should have been mm -hmm. far far stronger uh, if we had, if South Africans had more savings, if we had more money available uh, for especially those people who cannot work now, not everyone can work remotely. Some people are simply mm -hmm. sitting at home without pay. If they had lots of savings, this outbreak would not be as economically disastrous as it is. 
uh, and government has not yet taken any of the proposals. I mean, it's uh, the FMF has been saying this tune for decades. It's not like our proposals now or anything new. We've told government, if you want to uh, solve unemployment, you need to get rid of these labor laws. You need to banish any thought of a minimum wage, etc. cetera. Uh, these are all things that government can and should have done already, but should definitely do now to lessen the impact of this uh, this virus. I mean, we, we need we need taxes cut. Some people are going to say, no, but government now more than ever needs more of our money. Well, now more than ever, we need more of our money as well. So we need to decide yeah. who is going to uh, uh, put the money to better use. Is it going to be government? Uh, which I wouldn't be surprised if they simply send more money to uh, state-owned enterprises, particularly ESCOM. Or uh, is it going to be us who are going to provide for our families, try and keep our businesses afloat? I think the answer is we need to get the money because we have more information at our disposal. We know what best to do with our own money. Um, so this is just something that need, that everyone needs to bear in mind. The economy was already practically collapsing before the outbreak. So don't allow government in future years. I mean, they're still talking about the 2008 financial crisis as an excuse. Don't let them take COVID-19 and the response to it into the future saying, Yes, but we did what was needed and uh, this was necessary. Now we must uh, really overcome the COVID-19 reaction. No, we must overcome government socialism. We must overcome government Mm. statism that it has relentlessly uh, peppered us with for decades now. That that is the problem. And while the reaction to COVID-19 definitely has a huge impact, we can very easily get out of it, I would say if government takes the appropriate policy measures after the the outbreak ends. And uh, what we absolutely cannot allow is for it to, when the outbreak is ended, to keep some of the new interventions it has put in place uh, in light of the outbreak, such as price controls, um, certain uh, uh, encouragements or directives uh, for companies to act in a certain way. The Competition Commission's power has seemingly uh, exploded now to even have people arrested for increasing prices. Some guy was arrested, I don't know, I think somewhere in Durban because he raised some price mm-hmm. of meat that is butchering. Uh, that is that is totally insane. Um, so definitely when the crisis ends, we need to insist that all these new policies enacted after, say, the beginning of March need to be automatically and immediately repealed. Otherwise, I mean, we're just giving government um, a massive uh, ideological victory to expand its own power in light of a crisis. This has happened continuously in the, in the past. Uh, throughout history, government uses crises to expand its power. We need to be extremely aware of that and, uh, and make sure we don't become victims of this again, especially given our own South African history. Uh, and what happened under apartheid. We need to be very, very aware to to the, the especially the economic uh, uh, interventions government has implemented uh, going forward. Can you imagine when this crisis has abated, whenever that might be, but if South Africa is one of the first countries to liberalize and free its economy, just yeah. imagine what it would do for economic growth in this country compared to other countries, which are all have followed the path of lockdowns and more regulations to greater or less extents. I think that would set a massive tone. Talking about getting investment and job creation and the fourth industrial revolution, whatever mm-hmm. whatever buzzwords you want to use. If you're really serious about that sort of thing, then yeah, this is a this is obviously a tragedy, but in many ways it's also a great opportunity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and one point I just want to put emphasis on, and I'm glad you brought it up, Martin, is the points of price controls. So this is basic econ 101, is if you want to alleviate shortages, you should allow the price mechanism to signal that, hey, in the market of, example, health um, hand sanitizer, there are bigger profit margins, it would be more efficient to allow for producers to shift their resource allocation to focus on that, and in the process, alleviate the shortage, whereas if you place price ceilings on it, you you will exacerbate shortages. And what people need to remember is if there are companies out there who make these things too expensive, they are in the end of the day screwing over their own revenue generation because they will provide because they will simply say, okay, well I can make a lot of money out of this. I'm gonna exorbitantly raise my prices. They will provide too many goods if 
in effect, there will be an excess supply of goods and a lot of their money will be wasted on goods that nobody's going to buy. So I think that's a very important point that people need to realize. But what's also problematic with, uh, for me with these regulations is the ambiguity. You know, how do you define an exorbitant price increase? U.S. government to determine that now prices should only be allowed to rise by 10%, not 15%. You, um, why Why only 15%? Why is that the maximum? Why not 17.2931%? Whatever, you get the point that I'm making. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's a very arbitrary regulation as well that is simply insane. And the problem is people have always loved price controls because people do not have an intuitive understanding of economics, which I don't blame anyone. And, you know, if you're not going to study, you're not going to have an intuitive understanding of it. But I'm really, really scared that they will say, okay, well, the Competition Commission should have permanent powers with respect to price regulations and price controls. And just some other proposals that I want to take us through here. I'm not going to mention all of them, but these are just two very broad proposals and they relate to EWC and NHI. So on the issue of EWC, we still need to remember that it is still an issue. Governments aren't going to let that go. They're not going to let NHI go. And especially now, NHI should be at the forefront of what we fight against and not for it. I mean, this crisis is just showing that a lot of people are, some are praising governments, a lot of them, unfortunately, but our public healthcare system is a disaster. Can you imagine if this, if this virus, which is going to detriment mentally poor people the most, um, it, it will basically cause people to overrun the, uh, uh, the public healthcare system and there will not be enough beds available, et cetera, et cetera. Now, can you imagine the government effectively nationalizes our healthcare sector? What it will do then? I mean, I've already seen proposals, not official government proposals, but people saying, you know, it would not be that bad if government should just nationalize private hospitals like they did in Spain, for example, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, this crisis can actually set the ground for government arguing that NHI is now needed more than ever. And I think that's very, very problematic. Yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, uh, the, I, I keep seeing this, this thing come up from, and I, I want to keep emphasizing this, coming up from liberals and libertarians, it, it, it annoys me terribly. But people are now saying, no, no, we need now, there's a crisis. We, we shouldn't be too strict on government. No, now is the exact time to be strict on government. That is, that I, I think if you look at the very roots of constitutionalism, that is the context in which it comes about, where, where there is a pressing social issue that seems to deserve government attention uh, and government intervenes. That is precisely the time when, uh, um, when, when people need to be uh, uh, concentrating and keeping government accountable. And we can't lose sight of uh, expropriation of health compensation and NHI. These are things that have been in government's uh, agenda for years now. And now it is going to use this very event to say, oh, well, but look, look, we were right all along. We absolutely need these things urgently to, to what, take land so we can build field hospitals or uh, whatever and uh, uh, make sure that the poor get access. The point is that is going to make, and, and the, the coronavirus outbreak provides the perfect cover. So if that crashes the economy, they'll just say, well, look, it was, the, it was the virus. When we know that it is totally rejecting investment by threatening the nationalization of, of uh, agricultural land, but and also of healthcare, um, we need to be wide awake. And I'm speaking specifically to government skeptics, ordinary government skeptics, people who usually are skeptical of government. Now is absolutely not the time to be trustful of this government. Nothing has changed in government for you to suddenly trust it. Nothing has changed. The only thing has changed that has changed is outside circumstances. There is now a new pandemic in our midst. Nothing in government has changed. They have not suddenly become trustworthy individuals. They have not suddenly become competent individuals. It is the exact same people who want to take private property. It's the exact same people who have this uh, disastrous anti-business, anti-entrepreneurship mentality. And it's the same people who want to virtually ban speech under the guise of hate speech. The same people who want to nationalize sports and gyms and all these things. 
the very, very same people. So yeah, be very aware of what is happening. Keep an eye on everything that government is doing, every single thing. And your gut reaction needs to be that you should not be doing that. Maybe they can justify doing it, but our initial reaction needs to be no. And every, all of our positions that we held before and still apply. EWC is still a bad idea. NHI is Even more so. And closed borders are still a bad idea. So none, none, none of this has changed. We just need to be extremely careful and extremely aware. Now is the time to be a radical liberal and libertarian. It is not the time to be a statist. Uh, I think if there's, an, if there's one thing that we know is constant in life, it, it's that the government, any government, it, we just, I don't want to make this just about the current ruling government, but any party or government in power wants to expand its power. So it's going to use any excuse, any reason to do so. Uh, it's on us who value freedom to to fight for it and to keep government in check. Freedom, I know it's a cliche for some people, but it really is under threat at all times from all sides, from the left, from the right. Take your pick from above, from below. Um, and it's up to people like us uh, and those of us who value freedom, individual liberty, to make sure that government toes the line. It's an emergency of the scale, no matter the scale, actually, um, doesn't justify, it doesn't nullify individual rights. Um, individual rights are absolute. So nothing in, in, in a specific context nullifies them. That's the point of principles and, and you know, that they're going to apply regardless of, of what else is going on. Yeah, that's a very important point. And I mean, yeah, your initial reaction should be aversion to government interference in society and not acceptance, even in the case of a crisis where people are fearing for their lives. I just want to put in a little, when we say you should be averse to government interference, we're not, say, we're not saying you should suddenly deem yourself Rambo and go out, go out on the, onto the streets on purpose and try to bait the military or the police into shooting you or whatever. Mm. No. When they say to do something, rather play it safe, abide by them. Um, I've, I, the, the official recommendations are you should have a there are complaint hotlines. Um, how effective they will be, we don't know. But you know, have a device with your cell phone or video camera, or GoPro, whatever, dash cam that you can film, and most importantly, record the audio of what is happening. To after the fact, then take action um, if you if you want to do so. But do not go out there. Do not be Rambo. You know, the people with guns will beat you. That is a sad and unfortunate fact. Um, so, yeah, and the general message is you should still be responsible, you know, do not go out unnecessarily, you should stay home. Just because we are against the government's interference in society does not mean we're suddenly legitimizing, legitimizing the stupidity of people who are still going out partying, still going out to the beach, etc., etc. No, that's just plain dumb, you know, you are not risking only your own life, but that of others as well, because there's but you don't necessarily know immediately after the virus, then you move around and you spread it and you infect other people. And the important legal point here is if is you can be criminally charged if you go out and infect other people, if you knew you had the virus especially, because it's criminal negligence. Um, I mean, a case can be made even for attempted murder in this instance. I think there's already a, there already is a case like that. So I think people need to be really, really, really careful and do not be selfish during this time. I mean, be selfish with respect to your freedoms and your rights and let the, the legitimate protection thereof, but still be wary and still just be a responsible individual. I think this is an important distinction that must be made. And then oh, just the last um, thing. Sorry, Jacques, I was going to say that's one of the most important points about freedom that people often forget. It comes with certain responsibility. So if you, you know, not that you, you, you should give government an excuse to infringe on your rights, but why not act? in a way that is consistent with respecting other people's rights and liberties as well. I mean, otherwise you, you almost, you think very little of the concept of freedom. Yes, definitely. And extroverts, I know this is a nightmare for you, but you know, download call of duty or counter strike, you'll suck at the beginning because introverts have been at this longer than you, way longer than you. But I mean, you, you, we need to make lifestyle adjustments. Again, I'm not legitimizing state interference, but also, do not want to legitimize stupidity on behalf of the general populace you know just be responsible stay in your house work from home if you can you now really feel for the people that 
are not going to receive a salary. I really hope employers have sympathy and give them something at least, even if it's just something to cover living costs. You know, um, but yeah, I really, I really feel for those people as well. And then just the last thing, gentlemen, um, the FMF recently released a book on our EWC conference that we had, I think it was at the um, end of 2018. So a book has been compiled with um, contributions from various authors from various countries as well on the importance of private property rights in the economy and in law and specifically. Uh, Martin, can you just give the listeners a rundown of the book? Hmm. Yeah, so we had a, a EWC, an anti-EWC conference in uh, 2018. That was the year. No, not a proud EWC conference. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we're, we're not in favor of that. But this was in response to Parliament's adoption of the resolution to have the Constitution amended. We had people from Ghana, Kenya, Nigeria, uh, Uganda, uh, India, and Venezuela, importantly, and Zimbabwe, importantly and all around the world uh, coming to South Africa and basically telling these uh, civil society in South Africa and government in no uncertain or equivocal terms that expropriation without compensation is a bad idea. It doesn't matter what your intentions are. It doesn't matter what, uh, what the past wrongs are. It's just a bad idea. Uh, and as an alternative to EWC, you should focus only on righting past wrongs and you do that through restitution. Uh, which has been a successful process in South Africa since 1995, I think, was when the Restitution of Land Rights Act was enacted. That process has been continuing. Government has not given enough um, resources to that process, and maybe that's something that government can and should do. But to target productive and legitimate private property, which government has said it will do, it's going to seize property that was not taken uh, by the apartheid government. It's prop if you as a, uh, a white farmer bought a farm from a black farmer in South Africa in 2005, your property is liable to be expropriated. And if you are a black farmer, your property is also, can also be expropriated and the media probably isn't going to talk about that, which is absolutely terrible. Uh, so it's the, the conference and the book that we're publishing has this unequivocal message of this is not a power that you want the government to have. It is not a power that's recognized around the world that governments have. There is no such thing as expropriation without compensation in the prosperous and democratic states of the world. There is always compensation when there's expropriation, always. Uh, and now we're trying to buck that trend and join countries like um, Venezuela, North Korea, etc., and uh, Zimbabwe, which is now rolling back its expropriation without compensation program. And we're trying, we're now only going to try it out. Bad idea. Uh, all the reasonable people agree. It's very difficult to find someone who can make a cogent argument in South Africa in favor of EWC without resorting to emotionalism, historical revisionism, etc. You will never hear an economic argument in favor of EWC. So bad idea, especially now when our economy is going to be uh, uh, riot road over roughshod by the re reaction to the uh, the coronavirus. So um, that is the message in the book. Obviously, not the, anything about the coronavirus, but uh, uh, it's totally against this idea. And the book is, of course, available on our website as an electronic book, which you can get for free and read. And please do and, and share the contents if you find something interesting in there. And uh, make the point keep making the point ewc is a bad idea under any and all circumstances yeah very true chris uh any last thoughts from your side yeah just to highlight i think an important philosophical or conceptual point around property rights and why they're so important so for anyone who might be listening to us now who is pro ewc just for a moment try and put yourself in the shoes of imagining that your worst political opponent i don't know if you if you hate donald trump let's say for an example imagine that he has that sort of power over you to take your property arbitrarily and he doesn't have to compensate you for that just imagine any government in the future having this sort of power over all south africans again i want to stress all south africans regardless of race class um, religion gender any of the above 
um, when a government has this sort of power, it legitimizes, it gives them the legitimacy to do more rights abuses in the future. Um, they can decide who can work where, who can live where. Once we allow this sort of change in our constitution, we set the stage for massive danger in the future. So just put yourself in those shoes. If you're really worried about dictatorships, um, people on the right, for example, controlling you, if you're more on the left of, of these sorts of debates, just think, you know, if that person has this power over you, the worst that they can possibly do to you. Yeah, very, very, very good point there by Chris. Um, yeah, I think that is that is all for today. I think this podcast has been going on for quite a while now. So if you've stuck with us to the end, thank you very much for that. Please remember to like and subscribe to our various social media channels, uh, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, unlike Martin, I can't remember all the specific handles, but just search for free. Market Foundation South Africa and you will be bound to find us on there um, especially during this time remember we are out there with you um, fighting for your freedoms and your rights along with various other civil organizations in South Africa so yeah from us here over at the Free Market Foundation till next time cheers sure yeah go well <laughs>